Om Namah Shivaya Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namaste So now we begin the Vidyeshwara Sanghita, which is the really the introduction to Shiva Purana because it gives the background knowledge. It gives the means of attainment and it describes the attainment in detail, which was only hinted at in the Mangalacharanam or Mahatmyam, the first section. So it opens with a wonderful introduction, a wonderful prayer to Shiva, Ajanta Mangala Majata Samana Bhava, and so on. These are all names of Shiva. The Lord of Ambika, huh? Shankaram Ambikesham, and so on. So it's very interesting because the first method given for self-realization in the next chapters is shravanam, hearing of the Lord's names, attributes, his pastimes, his uh, associates, I mean, everything about him. One should hear, not from just anybody or any source, but from the Vedic scriptures, the authorized sources. So the Vedas and Upanishads are summarized in the Puranas. Now, of the 18 Puranas, the Shiva Purana is the foremost because it gives all the secrets on how to realize Shiva. And Shiva being Maheshwara is the king of all gods. He's the original, Isha and from him all the others have come. So this kind of talk is after Shravanam, Kirtanam, glorifying the Lord and his qualities and so on, whatever has been heard in words. So after hearing Shravanam, one remembers Smaranam and then glorifies Kirtanam. So in this way, the mind is suffused with the transcendental qualities of the Lord. And this is called mananam, or contemplation. And we've gone over contemplation very early in the uh, channel as being a very important means. And here it's confirmed. The sages ask a very important question, really, the only question, how can we become free of the various ills of the age of Kali Yuga? We all know this is going on. We all experience this every day. We all read the news and we know or we hear what is going on. And of course, it's not very good for spiritual life in one way, because it distracts us and it interferes with conflicts with spiritual values. But in another way, the suffering of the age of Kali is the goad, the impetus, the motivation for performance of sadhana, because the suffering is so great. Any sane person wants to get out of here. So how do we do that? Well, that is the subject matter in the next couple of chapters. Now, in the second chapter of the Vidyeshwara Sanghita, the means or the answer is given. How do we get out of this age of Kali? How do we counteract all the ills and the suffering? Through hearing Shiva Purana. And why is that? because Shiva Purana embodies the essence of Vedanta. Now, Vedanta 
in the form of Vedanta Sutra is a very esoteric subject. Not many people have the background to be able to approach it, understand it, and realize it. But when that same subject matter is presented in the form of stories, it becomes easy to understand, easy to realize. And especially in the form of the Panchakshara Mantra, Om Namah Shivaya. It's so easy. Shiva is so approachable. Even though he's known to be hard to realize, that means to realize him in full. But to begin the approach to him is very easy. Anybody can do it. There is no bar to anyone. No one is excluded. Everyone is included in Shiva's family. And the, the proof of this is that he gives boons and his association even to the demons. Even though the demons in many ways are working against him by their conflict with the demigods. So this is uh, evidence of his great detachment and equality toward all. He's equanimous, means he has an equal mind towards everyone. So everyone and anyone can approach Shiva and get the benefits thereof. Then there's a long section where Sutta Goswami says, as long as Shiva Purana has not risen high in the sky, that all these ills of Kali Yuga will continue. There will be so many conflicts, so many confusions, so many questions, so many uh, contradictions between different scriptures, different religions, different deities, different holy places, different methods of attainment, and so on. Why is that? Because Shiva Purana embodies the highest authority of the Vedas and Upanishads. Therefore, it can resolve all these questions. And I've already read it all the way through. So I can tell you, this is absolutely true. Shiva Purana contains the answers to so many questions I've had for years, decades even, going back to my early days in the beginning of Vedic studies that aren't answered in any other scripture. So everyone should study this Shiva Purana, or at least hear it. Huh? You can hear it on this series or in the podcast based on this series. Look in the video description for the links, and you can hear it as a podcast. Take it with you wherever you go. Now I want to clarify some of the benefits of Shiva Purana. Sutta says that hearing Shiva Purana gives the benefit of the horse sacrifice. What does that mean? It means that you gain the equivalent of being the emperor of the whole planet. Now, this may seem impossible and unrealistic, but when one ascends to the higher lokas, one gets powers and enjoyment that are equivalent to a great emperor, a great king. Because one gains the purity and the gravity of mind and the unity of purpose with Shiva that can handle this kind of power, this kind of opulence. And he says many other things too, that even if you don't want to be a great emperor, even if you want just an ordinary position in life. Still, hearing this Shiva Purana frees you from all sins. Now we've all committed sins, we've all made mistakes, we all have things that we regret that we've done. And who knows what happened in previous lives. That's why we're here in this suffering condition. So even if we just want the ordinary way of life, Shiva Purana gives all facility for that. And more than that, it brings us to enlightenment. It brings us to liberation. And Sutta describes the five kinds of liberation. We'll get into that later. 
that's a rather technical subject. And in fact, we've already discussed it in a previous video. But the point is that Shiva Purana amplifies the meaning of Aum. Aum, the three-lettered mantra, is the essence of the Vedas. That's why before every Vedic mantra and after every Vedic mantra or prayer, Aum is chanted. And this is very important because Aum and Shiva are identical with the Supreme Brahman. This is why Shiva is represented and worshipped as the Shiva Lingam, the formless form, because he is identical with Brahman. His quality of being Brahman is not shared by any other deity. So many people make false claims that this deity and that deity are equal to Brahman or are the Supreme Brahman themselves. But this is not actually confirmed in the Vedic scriptures. The only deity mentioned in the four Vedas and the Upanishads based on them is Shiva. All other gods are derivative. And that's why only Shiva is worshipped in the form of the Lingam, as well as his bodily form. All other gods are simply worshipped in their bodily form. And lest you say, well, that includes Shakti also. No, because <laughs> the Linga form embodies both Shiva and Shakti. The stand of the Lingam is Shakti. And the Lingam itself, of course, is Shiva. So Lingam worship is worship of Shiva and Shakti together. And we've all seen the female male form of Shiva, Adhanarishwara. So Adhanarishwara is intimately connected with the origin story of the Lingam, which we'll get to in chapter four. And so I could go on describing these things for a long time. But the best thing is for you to hear and read and actually study this chapter because it gives the basis of understanding Shiva, who Shiva is and why he's worshiped as the Supreme Lord. And this is the knowledge that ultimately leads us to complete self-realization and liberation from material suffering. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.